All right, so we're going to end this section with a theorem. Um, there's a number of ways that you'll find this theorem stated depending on the book that you're in. Of course, we're, we're in apex calculus. Uh, so the setup here is you've got a continuous function on a closed interval. You've chosen some partition. Probably uniform, but doesn't have to be. Okay? Um, if your partition is not uniform, uh, you can introduce this notation here. This is called the norm of the partition. It's, so basically what we do is among all the different delta x's, right, the length of each one of your subintervals, you find the biggest one. Right? That's what the norm of the partition is. It's, so you, know, you might have intervals of, of different lengths. If your partition is not uniform, you choose the longest of all those possible lengths. Um, okay? If it's a uniform partition, then of course they're all the same length, and this is just your delta x. So the first thing is that for a continuous function, you're guaranteed that this limit exists, the limit of the Riemann sum, right? So this is the Riemann sum for the function f and the partition delta x, okay? Um, saying that the norm of the partition goes to zero is the same thing as saying that n goes to infinity if you're working with, let's say, a, a uniform partition, or really any partition for that matter, okay? Um, the ci, right, um, it doesn't matter how you choose the ci's. That's kind of the important part of this theorem, right? Um, this limit will exist regardless of how you choose the point in each one of the intervals. Um, what's more is the limit doesn't actually depend on how you choose these, okay? No matter how you choose those, you will always get the same answer. And that answer is the definite integral, okay? So... This is one way of sitting. Uh, other textbooks will define the definite integral to be this limit if that limit exists, right? Um, and then you kind of, you know, you explore the fact that, oh, yeah, it's related to area. Um, and then you say, okay, well, now I need to know when does this limit exist? And so one of the things that you, you would state as a theorem and maybe try to prove if you were in a more advanced course is that this limit will always exist if your function is continuous. Um, in fact, uh, you can relax that a little bit. Your function doesn't necessarily have to be continuous um, for this limit to exist, for it to give you um, the definite integral. Um, as long as your function is bounded, so it doesn't go off to infinity anywhere, uh, and as long as you don't have too many discontinuities, in particular if you have a finite number of discontinuities, so here we're talking about like jump discontinuities or removable discontinuities, um, this integral will still exist, right? So you might, for example, you might want to be able to make sense of of the integral of a function that goes here and then it drops down and does that and you're going from A to B, right? And there's some intermediate point C where you've got sort of a, a jump discontinuity and, and it would make sense in this context that your total area is just the area from A to C plus the area from, from C to B, right? Even though there's a discontinuity. Uh, so. If you were in a more advanced course, um, like, a, like a second or third year level analysis course, you might start analyzing you know, the conditions under which um, this limit actually exists. So you can talk about when does this Riemann integral exist. Um, you could do that, right? But we're in just kind of a regular standard Calc 1 course where the main goal that we have is knowing how to calculate these things, right? It's nice to know where they come from. It's important to know where they come from. Right? Uh, if you are going to study numerical integration, then it's important to know uh, where this comes from because numerical integration more or less amounts to saying, okay, well, you know, in the cases where I don't know how to do this exactly, I know I can do it approximately, right, for a particular n. So you can still apply those, those approximation methods um, and get approximate answers. So that's one of the things that you might do, right? But we're, we're not in the business of proving theorems in this course. Um, now, the other thing that we, we have to deal with is that if we had to calculate every single definite integral by taking limits of Riemann sums, well, we're not going to get very far, right? We've seen a few examples. We've seen enough to know that this can get pretty tedious, right? Uh, there's a lot of work to, to do. There's a lot of algebra involved. And, and if you think about it, we really only have the tools to deal with polynomials up to like degree three, right? Because we have these summation formulas that work. You know, what if we're doing the integral of like a trig function or an exponential function, right? We don't have the tools to do that. Uh, so next up is we understand finally that connection between antiderivatives and integrals, and that's going to set us up 
to evaluate these definite integrals in a much more efficient way.